lines are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. Today's call is also being recorded. If there are any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Paul Mead. Sir, you may begin. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning or good afternoon and welcome everybody to the Health and Human Services Working Group on Lyme and Other Tick-Borne Diseases um, webinar on emerging tick-borne Emerging Issues in Tick-Borne Diseases. Um, my name is Paul Mead. I am the Chief of the Bacterial Diseases Branch in the Division of Vector-Borne Disease at CDC. Um, and uh, I appreciate you all joining today. Just a quick uh, reminder before we begin that the views of uh, the participants uh, are their own and do not necessarily reflect those uh, of their agencies or institutions. Let me say a few words before we get started just to remind everybody why ticks and tick-borne diseases are a significant public health problem. Uh, of all vector-borne diseases reported in the U.S., 95% are caused by pathogens spread by ticks. In recent decades, the number of tick-borne cases reported per year has increased steadily and cases have been reported over an expanding geographic area. We are also seeing an increasing uh, number of new tick-borne agents recognized to cause human disease. And finally, although not yet a trend, uh, we are monitoring, or many groups are monitoring, the spread of the Asian longhorn tick, which has recently been recognized in the U.S. and has the potential to serve as a vector for endemic and potentially exotic human pathogens. Shown here are the number of reported cases of some of the key uh, tick-borne illnesses uh, for the last two years uh, of completed reporting, 2016 and 2017. And the bottom line here is that uh, these pathogens have caused uh, almost 60,000 reported cases uh, of tick-borne illness, uh, the worst year ever. So the objective of today's uh, webinar is really to highlight some emerging trends in tick-borne diseases and what can be done about them. And our speakers and topics today are first uh, Denise Mania from USDA APHIS who will provide an update on the Asian longhorn tick, Haemophysalis longicornis. Then Dr. William Nicholson um, from my sister branch at CDC will discuss the alpha-gal allergy following tick bite, what we really know. Third, Dr. Kevin Esveld from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology will discuss Mice Against Ticks and a community-guided effort to prevent Lyme disease via gene editing. And finally, uh, Dr. Ben Beard um, from our division will provide an overview of the national strategy of vector-borne diseases. We will hold questions until the end of the session, and ideally we would like people to submit their questions online through the uh, web interface. This will allow us to try and get to the most questions possible. Uh, when you do submit questions, please provide your identity and indicate uh, to which speaker your questions are, uh, are addressed. And as I say, we will um, save uh, questions until the end of the presentation. So without further ado, um, let me just mention that there is a, a website to get further information, but why don't we move on to our first speaker, um, Denise Conia. All right, I am going to try to pull up my presentation. All right, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, thank you. Well, um, first, thank you for the invitation to um, participate today. Um, again, my name is Denise Bonilla. I'm an entomologist at the USDA in our um, Veterinary Services Strategy and Policy Ruminant Health Center. Today I'm going to give you an update, just a snapshot of what's going on in um, the world of longhorn tick here in the United States. Here our story starts. 
Back in 2017, in Hunterdon County, New Jersey, a lady came into the local mosquito control complaining of ticks on her sheep and herself. In late October, the entomologist there went out to investigate and found um, the sheep was badly infested with multiple stages of a tick that didn't quite look like the ticks that had been found in the area. Um, long story short, um, later the tick made its way to Rutgers um, and Monmouth County Tick Lab where it, it received a molecular identification to Haemophysalis longicornis, the longhorn tick the Asian longhorn tick. On November 9, 2017, NVSL taxonomically confirmed this identification. This was significant because this was the very first time this tick had been seen out of USDA quarantine. What first looked like a, a local infestation in one county in New Jersey soon became evident that it was much more widespread than we had originally thought. Today we have 11 confirmed states. Virginia leads the county count with 24 counties. West Virginia, with 15 counties, has the oldest recorded specimen from a white-tailed deer in 2010. This ID only happened because our National Veterinary Services Lab went back and re-examined um, rabbit ticks, Haemophysalis leporis flustris. These two ticks look similar. And I suggest anyone who has rabbit ticks archived um, go back and take another look and make sure that they're not longhorn ticks. Joining this list of states are also New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Maryland, Arkansas, Connecticut, Kentucky, and most recently, Tennessee. Um, it seems like whenever I make a um, Whenever we make a map, another county comes up positive, and so um, Tennessee actually has three confirmed counties at this point. Haemophysalis longicornis is what they call the scrub or bush tick in other parts of the world. Um, here in the United States, the proper name is the Asian longhorn, Asian longhorn tick. It is a three-host tick, and you can find all three active stages on one host. It originated in Northeast Asia, but then invaded Australia and New Zealand. It has the ability to survive harsh winters, and in other parts of the world it enjoys meadows, paddocks, and moisture. Here you can see the longhorn tick, um, female on the lower right, and the nymph to the left. And on the top are the Exodes scapularis. Um, to the top right is a female a male to the left, and then a nymph with poppy seeds in the middle to show the size. Show the size. There's two major forms of this tick. Um, there's a bisexual form and a parthenogenic invasive form. This parthenogenesis, mean, parthenogenesis means that a female can lay fertile eggs without the presence of a male. Without the guys to hold them back, these girls can create large populations quickly. The, these thousands of ticks, possibly feeding on just one animal, can feed until the animal dies. In Australia, this lifestyle is obligate, and males only really occur once every 400 females. Personally, one of my biggest concerns is how this tick happily feeds alongside other tick species on the same host. This co-feeding may possibly impact the transmission cycles of our endemic tick-borne diseases and will definitely further complicate our knowledge of tick-borne disease ecology here in the United States. They're further, these ticks are further a concern because of the large number of viral, bacterial, and protozoal pathogens that are associated with them in other parts of the world. While no pathogens have been found in the ticks that have been tested in the U.S. to date, you can see here their potential for vectoring species of Tylaria, Babesia, and scary hemorrhagic viruses. Um, this list that you're looking at right now, um, these, these pathogens were confirmed by trans, transmission experiments. This list um, now is um, more pathogens found in these ticks um, that were found um, infected in the field. Here you'll see related, some related strains of our endemic tick diseases, such as anaplasmosis, or lichiosis, borreliosis and some viruses, polysome. 
So now that we know how important the tick can be, I want to take you back to examining our situation here in the U.S. Back in winter 2017, this tick disappeared in New Jersey, and we all held our breath hoping that it wouldn't emerge again in the spring. But sure enough, at 4 p.m. on March, Friday the 13th, I received a call from New Jersey that the ticks were again active. They were finding nymphs at that point first, and that adheres to this normal pathway here in bold. However, in New York in 2019, the first stage found after diapause was actually um, adults. And by May, people um, in different states were reporting all stages as active. And um, all of these ticks have been, were being found by um, flagging, dragging, and um, carbon dioxide traps. These are the detections graphed by host and month. Um, if you ignore that December blip right there, that was just a, a data blip, um, you can see that there are blank areas in the winter. Um, and we, we can obviously see here that we have a tick that diapauses and reemerges in the spring. This tick is a generalist feeder worldwide, and we're starting to close in on, the, on our worldwide list as we now have positives from humans, birds, domestic animals, livestock, and large to medium wild mammals. Although small mammals have been sampled, these ticks so far haven't been found on them. Um, one note of potential good news is that even though they will bite humans, humans don't seem to be um, a preferred host, um, and they and here in the U.S., um, it seems that they're not aggressively trying to bite humans. So what's next? Um, we want you to be educated so that you can detect these ticks in your area and treat before they become established. Here to the left, you can see what we know so far um, in, in line with detections. Here to the right is a map from a grouping of models where the three best fit models overlaid create the red areas where these ticks are likely to become established if introduced. Now that I've adequately scared you, I'd like to offer you a few tools to deal with this. First, you can tell, first of all, you can tell the difference between um, this, he, this tick and the native Haemophysalis. One of the tricks is the palpal extensions on both the ventral and dorsal sides. Um, Longicornis has them on both sides of the palp. Um, other ticks and other hemophysalis here don't have it on both sides. Um, now we also have this key down here that can help. Um, but a, a word of caution. So um, when you find, when, the, when this tick is found in a new state or a county or on a new host, it tends to rile up the media and cause concern to our animal and public health stakeholders. For this, reason that we ask, for this reason, we ask that first detections in an area get a, either a molecular confirmation or our entomologists at our National Veterinary Services Lab, NVSL, are happy to do a secondary taxonomic ID. Here are some more tools. They can be found by Googling USDA vector-borne disease. Um, down here on the bottom right, um, this guidance is was crafted to help our animal health partners. Um, it, there's a lot of information on longhorn ticks, but also um, it, there's good information on how to deal with any kind of exotic tick that might come in into an area. Um, it also has the NVSL submission information and instructions on how to, how to ship the ticks. Um, we also have a fact sheet. This is our situation report in the top right. This is the um, joint fact sheet we have with the CDC. Um, and these, these links that are on here have um, some really good information on ticks and tick-borne diseases and some nice um, photos of the longhorn ticks. So um, last of all, I just, I just want you to remember that these are just ticks. They're not anything like super-powered demons. While they're important, they can be killed and they can be managed. Um, we've had um, environmental treatments in, in New Jersey of Landis and carbamate that have worked. 
Um, we, we New Jersey used a permethrin wash on the index sheet that worked. And so far, no ticks tested by USDA ARS showed, um, none of them have shown pyrethrin resistance. Uh, mowing and cleaning uh, around the premises um, may help with tick incursions. And as always, please remember to wear your repellent and check yourself, your family, and your animals for ticks. Um, if you have livestock that are impacted, um, please check with your agricultural extension agents or your veterinarians. Um, or us in VS, we're always happy to help. So that, with that, there's just so many people to acknowledge. Um, so this is outdated daily. Um, I appreciate uh, the help of all of our people. It's been an amazing um, response, and um, it will continue to be a, a, a dynamic relationship with many, many stakeholders. So here is my information. If you have questions after today, or if you have concerns or need someone to talk to, please feel free to reach out. Um, we have a monthly stakeholder call for Asian longhorn tick. And if you'd like to be included in that call, um, different agencies and states give updates. And I'm happy to include you if you would like to um, drop me a line. I'll add you to the list. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Ms. Bonilla, for that uh, overview and for your, your efforts on this whole issue. Our next speaker is Dr. William Nicholson from CDC, who will be uh, discussing the alpha-gal allergy following tick bite. And uh, please bear with us as we try and um, work out getting the slides pulled up. I'm not having any luck here, Paul. I can see it, but I can't move it. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. OK. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk today about uh, a new condition that is uh, generating concern, um, alpha-gal allergies. Today, I'd like to talk about what is alpha-gal, uh, discuss some of the clinical and epidemiological features associated with this condition, uh, how it's managed, and how the connection uh, between alpha-gal alpha and ticks was made, and what do we really know about that. Uh, alpha-gal is the short name for galactose alpha-1,3 galactose. Here's the molecule here. It's an oligosaccharide. It's synthesized by the glycosylation using enzyme alpha-1,3 galactosyl transferase. This enzyme is not active in humans, greater apes, and old world monkeys. Um, so it's found in the tissues of most mammals, including sheep, cattle, uh, and swine, but it's not found in the, the apes. Uh, it's not found in fish, birds, or reptile tissues. Um, antibodies of the IgG and IgM classes are made by humans to alpha-gal as, as they eat these various meats, and so they're, they're usually present in those particular classes of antibody. Uh, of concern to some regulatory agencies may be the fact that alpha-gal is also found in a number of food additives, um, pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and some tissues that are used for xenotransplantation. The story begins with a monoclonal antibody that was produced for um, uh, chemotherapy for cancer. Tuximab is a mouse human uh, hybrid or chimeric uh, monoclonal antibody against the epidermal growth factor receptor. And the alpha-gal epitope is actually found in the FAB arm portion of the molecule. So the initial trials with this chemical for um, uh, metastatic colon cancer started in 2000. It was finally approved in 2004 and later expanded for other cancers. 
2007, O'Neill and Associates sh uh, found that there was a high incidence of infusion reactions in Tennessee and North Carolina patients. And um, this occurred five to 20 minutes after infusion. Uh, normally, this is delivered intravenously, so it was very, very quick. Uh, and because many people reacted on the first dose of the drug, this suggested that they had been sensitized in some way uh, to an epitope that would, would cause the reaction. Uh, Chung later uh, discovered that this was an IgE response and that IgE was um, uh, directed against the alpha-gal uh, antigen. Uh, this thing shrunk quite a bit is a way to bring it back. Um, So uh, the, the proposed mechanism was that um, when the cetuximab uh, cross-linked IgE that was bound to mast cells that you would cause activation and degranulization with the, the release of a number of chemicals that would cause the, the itching and anaphylactic uh, uh, syndrome that might be seen. Um, so how was this associated with kick? This association occurred uh, in, on two different continents at about the same time. Dr. Van Noonan in Australia had identified this uh, uh, being associated with ticks, uh, uh, primarily with Ixodes holocyclus. Uh, and Thomas Platt Mills and Scott Cummins, working in Virginia at the time, uh, also uh, saw a connection with ticks and tick bites. Um, Dr. Platt Mills had been working with the um, uh, response to the cetuximab and noticed that the geographic distribution was fairly restricted. And they began to say, well, what, what else would have that geographic distribution? And someone in the lab said, well, that just looks like the CDC map for Rocky Mountain spotted fever distribution. Uh, that was kind of a big leap, but as we know, this is not just Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but spotted fever group Rickettsia in the United States. And the allergies tended to associate with that distribution uh, and with the map of Amblyomma americanum. So that was how the connection with Amblyomma americanum was first made. but. Uh, the evidence was, was an association uh, with not a lot of uh, strong evidence that uh, it was truly associated with this tick. Um, they also did a seroprevalence study, and they found that uh, the high seroprevalence of IgE to alpha-gal was found in the southeastern and south-central United States, and it correlated fairly well with the hatched area there, which is the estimated distribution of Amblyomma americanum. Uh, it was seen that alpha, IgE to alpha-gal increased with time following one or more tick bites. And in this figure, you'll see that with the increasing tick bite, the level of IgE to alpha-gal increased. Bites that had a longer duration of a hypersensitive reaction, so you were itching and, and had edema for a longer period, would result in higher levels of IgE to alpha-gal. Um, so the question was, is this really associated with the tick? So they, they took whole tick extracts, ground those up, and showed that they could use the tick to inhibit uh, the binding of IgE. Um, uh, and so that suggested that crushed whole ticks did uh, contained the alpha-gal, but was that alpha-gal, you know, being produced by the tick, or could it possibly be in the blood meal of the tick? Um, other ticks have been associated. I'll talk more about that later. But um, in Ixodes ricinus, uh, researchers found that it could be localized to the GI tract of Ixodes ricinus nymphs. Uh, you may or may not can see this very well, but it's a reddish color in the, in the gut of the tick, as shown in uh, A and B. 
Amblyomma sculptum and has also been associated with this, this uh, condition. So uh, experiments to induce salivation by philocarpine uh, produced sal saliva. These were uh, inoculated into knockout mice, and they produced anti-alpha-gal. So it suggested that this was a salivary um, delivered uh, oligosaccharide. A uh, very recent study that just came out, and I'd recommend looking at because they have very nice uh, images, uh, using immunoblotting, mass spec, and immunolocalization, they were able to show that um, Amblyomma americanum does contain uh, alpha-gal antigens within the partially fed salivary gland and in the saliva itself. But interestingly, um, Ixodes scapularis, which has not been associated at this point with this condition, does also contain the alpha-gal antigen. Uh, Amblyomma maculatum and Dermacinter variabilis did not seem to end, uh, contain the antigen. When uh, this condition occurs, as we mentioned before, with the intravenous introduction of cetoximab, you get uh, a response very quickly, within 20 minutes after infusion. But what we're generally talking about now is the red meat allergy, which is a delayed uh, type uh, reaction. This occurs three to six hours after the meal before you begin to see the uh, allergic symptoms. And so uh, some of the doctors have referred to this as midnight hives after a meat dinner. Uh, there's redness, hives, itching, uh, angioedema, respiratory difficulty, hypotension, GI conditions can occur, and you can get anaphylaxis with this condition. So it's not an every time allergy. It, there, there are other cofactors which include the volume of meat ingested, the fattiness of the meat, whether it's organ tissue or not, alcohol ingestion. Uh, all of this may uh, influence the absorption of the, the antigen in the gut, and then later you see the expression of the allergic response. Uh, University of Virginia researchers have recently even linked IgE to alpha-gal to plaque buildup in the arteries of the heart. And this generally occurred in older people. It should, could also be somewhat of a cofactor if they're eating a significant amount of meat. Um, but a lot of these associations are based on a lot of single case reports or small case series and not necessarily larger studies. But what we do know is this occurs within a few to six months after tick bite. It's usually a singular allergy. It's not associated with allergy to other uh, antigens. Uh, the B group blood type seems to convey some level of protection against the, the alpha-gal allergy. It's generally seen in older adults, but maybe seen in children. Um, so somehow uh, the bite is sensitizing the um, the body to produce IgE, and then later you get the response to the to the meat ingestion. Most of the cases are occurring in late summer and fall, and it's uh, at least anecdotally often associated with larval ticks. But part of this may be the the number of larval ticks that you may be bitten by at any one time. Uh, there are diagnostic tests available. Uh, probably the most common is the immunocap IgE to alpha-gal that's available uh, at commercial labs. The distribution in the United States, uh, as shown on the right, is um, now about 39 states. And, and, uh, so you can see that it's well outside the range of the single tick Amblyomma americanum. The distribution worldwide is six continents and 19 countries. I uh, have them listed here. So this is a, a growing concern worldwide. Associated in those uh, different countries with a variety of, of tick species, you, see, you can see that amblyoma is well represented, a number of Ixodes species, and as I said, not yet associated with Ixodes scapularis. And as Denise just mentioned, Haemophysalis longicornis, this is now another, another concern. Oops, I lost everything. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Um, so what is the public health burden of this emerging condition? Um, Plats mills and commons uh, have uh, estimated in the United States there have been about 5,000 cases since its discovery through 2013. And of those, about 1,000 had been identified there as they worked in Virginia. Dr. Cummins moved to North Carolina, is now at UNC, and he's seen approximately 808 to 10 patients per week. Um, Arkansas has reported 270 cases with one death between January 2013 and September 2015, and reported this in a poster. Uh, it's far fewer in Australia, but Van Nunen says she has about one to two patients per week and seen, had seen over 600 cases by December 2014. Again, no official condition or statistics are kept, so these are based on reports in the literature. But the incidence in Virginia is about 13 per 100,000, and in Australia, 113 per 100,000. How is it managed? Tick bite prevention measures are, as we constantly uh, try to uh, suggest for uh, infection prevention, will help, and, and you will see a, a decline in IgE levels over time if no additional tick bites occur. Uh, it can be uh, treated, you know, in the immediate stage with Benadryl or epinephrine, uh, but generally it's the avoidance of mammalian meat in the diet. Um, as people are treated, some diet dairy products may be added over time. Some lean meat may be reintroduced to see if there's a, uh, a response. And, and uh, generally, people will maybe come back into being able to take uh, uh, red meat. Uh, desensitization for allergy is very limited in use and uh, not really uh, widely available. Um, what we are doing now is uh, our division has tasked us with looking at uh, this condition because we are uh, the Rakatsu group and work with Amblyoma Americanum a great bit. Um, the Epi group is looking at a descriptive study based on a database of previously diagnosed patients with Dr. Cummins and they uh, have a case control study that will begin enrolling patients. Um, there's always a concern about tick bite history because it's likely subject to recall bias uh, as far as number and, and uh, the timing of such bites. We are hoping to use some of the serologic assays to look for antibodies in the patients to tick salivary proteins such as cal reticulin or AV422 and hope that they would give us a, a, a marker of tick bite. Uh, these markers have been tested some in humans, cal reticulin in humans, and AV422 in both humans and animals. Uh, these do cross-react against genera of ticks, so um, we have currently expressed in our uh, branch uh, cal reticulin AV422 derived from Amblyoma americanum, and we'll be working on some assays that we hope will, will help us answer this question if there really was a tick bite. Um, I know that's a lot in a short period of time, but I appreciate the opportunity to present it and we'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Here's my information here. So thank you, Paul, and back to you. Great. Thank you, uh, William, for that. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Asfeld from MIT, who will be talking about uh, mice and ticks. And uh, please hold on for a moment while we try and bring up his presentation. There we go. Dr. Esfold, are you on? All right. Hello, everyone. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm going to spend a bit of time letting you know about a potential new way to address tick-borne disease, in this case through genome editing of the reservoir. So we're interested in combating diseases spread by Ixodes scapularis, and specifically by altering the primary host, the white-footed mouse. Now, there we go. So as, as all of you certainly know, tick-borne disease is especially concentrated in the northeast of the country. And here in Massachusetts, two of the worst afflicted areas are the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And it's these communities that we've been working with in developing a possible new approach to combating and specifically preventing tick-borne disease. Now, as you know, Borrelia burgdorferi is passed between host organisms and ixodes. And this is an ecological cycle of transmission, which as a side effect results in transmission to humans when infected ixodes bite people. The Mice Against Ticks project aims to heritably immunize the white-footed mice so that they can no longer efficiently infect the ticks because Paramiscus leucopus is responsible for infecting more ticks than any other individual host. Our goal is to drive the infection cycle in reverse. Fewer infected ticks will mean fewer secondary reservoirs, which will mean fewer infected ticks, and so on. So how can this be done? Well. Of course, there was a protective vaccine, and there still is one available for animals against OSPE on Borrelia. Our goal is to engineer mice to produce protective antibodies against Borrelia and possibly against Ixodes themselves by first identifying white-footed mice antibodies against these markers, isolating B cells that make these antibodies and specifically the DNA within those B cells, producing them in the laboratory and testing them to confirm binding, neutralization, and eventually protection against infection. Now, we've identified an initial set of antibodies from Paramiscus leucopus that bind OSPE, and we're currently isolating more with the help of a CDMRP award. And you might say, well, why bother isolating white-footed mouse antibodies when there are already perfectly functional antibodies from muscle mycelis in humans? And the answer is that this project is community guided and it has been from the start. That is, we went to the residents of these islands and we said, we believe it may be possible to prevent disease by heritably immunizing these mice. There are different ways that we could go about it. Among them, we could isolate white-footed mouse antibodies, which are of course going to be present at some level, low level in a few mice, and encode those in the white-footed mouse genome so that they would be passed on to descendants. Or we could just use pre-existing antibodies from other organisms, such as lab mice or people, and encode those in the mice. And the community response was overwhelmingly, we are interested in this idea, but please try to keep genome editing as natural as possible. That is, we're open to the idea of engineered mice was the by far majority response. But we would prefer if you try not to use any DNA or functions that are not normally present in white-footed mice, if at all possible. So that's what we're doing. The project is guided by the steering committees on each island, um, appointed by the boards of health, and we regularly visit the islands and, and talk to local residents in order to find out what they think, whether community opinion is, has been changed in any way. And we've had a, a number of media coverage and constantly hear from people outside of the islands as well. So our core technical team right now is at MIT, Tufts, and Harvard, and we are currently bringing on new collaborators. Our timeline for this project is uncertain because no one has ever done anything like this before. No one has ever, in fact, made Paramiscus leucopus transgenic before, although in this case our goal is to make them technically cisgenic because, again, we don't want to move in any DNA from any other species insofar as it can be helped. So phase one involves identifying the protective antibodies, which we're now well in the process of doing, and building immune mice, including engineering Paramiscus leucopus, which again, we're making progress in, and also preparing for field trials, that is identifying appropriate islands and collecting baseline ecological data. 
because we will need to know what happens to the environment if you introduce large numbers of heritably immunized Paramiscus leucopus. Then phase two would involve introducing these mice onto small islands. Ideally, one area would receive the altered heritably immunized mice, the engineered mice. Another area would receive lab-reared wild-type mice. That is a similar form of introducing mouse genes into the population, but they would just be normal wild-type genes. And the third region would receive no change. And then these trials would be monitored by primarily independent ecologists who would then deliver a report to the communities as well as to the regulatory agencies on the outcomes. And then phase three would potentially involve releasing mice on large inhabited islands, such as potentially Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, and possibly smaller inhabited islands such as Cuddyhunk. If that is successful, then ideally we will have developed technologies initially in Mus musculus and then translate to paramiscus that could apply this approach to the mainland. Now, before I get to that, a little bit about ecological studies. So this is the primary concern that most citizens and ecologists have with respect to the project. That is, what might go wrong in the environment, given that we don't understand all relevant ecological interactions? And the answer is we have suspicions, but we really can't say for sure. The safe way to find out is to introduce the mice at a small scale, ideally in a mostly an uninhabited setting like the field trial islands, and then see what happens over time. But ideally, we want islands that are highly representative of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard as the primary communities. So we have a set of different islands, uh, some of which are public and some of which are private. And we're currently, uh, Sam Telford at Tufts has been doing field work along with some members of my laboratory developing baseline data collection and at adding to existing uh, repositories of data on these islands and looking at optimization for whether it can be done on a single island or, or adjacent islands, whether we can use nest boxes to improve in introduction, and we're doing a great deal of computational modeling. And all of this work has been supported by the Rainwater Foundation. Now, how could you possibly introduce enough mice, that is, if you want to disrupt transmission of Borrelia or any other pathogen from mice to ticks, you need most of the mice in the environment to be immune. One way of doing that on an island is simply to introduce enough immune mice because there is not sufficient gene flow with wild type populations introducing enough copies of the protective antibody encoding genes, which would be produced in this case from the liver cells, into the population would result in most descendants inheriting an engineered gene and consequently being resistant to infection. But on the mainland, there are billions of paramiscus leucopus. We cannot possibly raise enough and re introduce enough copies efficiently to immunize an entire mainland population. So many people look to gene drive. So CRISPR genome editing has allowed us to duplicate naturally occurring phenomena such as gene drive, which is what occurs when a genetic element spreads through a population, even if it does not provide a fitness advantage. And in this case, we don't expect immunity to Borrelia to provide a fitness advantage to Paramiscus leucopus because it does not cause symptoms in that species. So with a gene drive, it's a way of ensuring inheritance of an engineered trait. And essentially, it involves making CRISPR genome editing recursive, encoding the CRISPR system into the genome of, in this case, the mouse, such that it edits the wild-type copy in heterozygotes and converts it to the engineered version encoding the antibodies. This might sound either good or terrifying, depending on your perspective. But we assume that there is no realistic possibility of either social or diplomatic approval to using the basic kind of gene drive, the self-propagating kind, for mice against ticks. And that's just because our models show that this kind of CRISPR-based gene drive system will spread to affect the entire species. That is, it would spread to all states in the country and up into Canada and down into Mexico. And we just don't see that as feasible. That, in, in fact, goes against the very idea of a field trial. You cannot test that sort of system in a field trial. And it would force this intervention on everyone, as well as creating international diplomatic complications. So instead, with NIH support from a DP2 New Innovator Award, 
in Mus musculus are working to develop a what we call a daisy drive system, which splits up the components of the CRISPR system onto different chromosomes. And component C <coughs> cuts and causes component B to drive. So it cuts the wild type version of, of B, and the B engineered DNA is copied over. The B element causes the A element to be copied, and the A element would, in this case, encode the antibodies of interest. And the net effect of, of this daisy chain drive system, and apologies, it looks like the animations are not quite working the way they should. If you have a CBA mouse, for example, that has all three links in this daisy chain, and it mates with a wild type, <clears throat> if it's homozygous across all loci, then all of the mice will inherit C and B and A. But one of the mice two generations down will no longer have inherited C, because C is a normal gene. It does not have any kind of inheritance advantage. So this mouse has lost the C element, which means that there is nothing causing B to be copied in the germline of this mouse. And that means that when it mates with wild type, some of its offspring will not encode the B element, leaving only A, meaning in the next generation, there will be mice that do not inherit any engineered elements at all. In other words, the daisy chain drive is self-exhausting. Every genetic link in this chain is lost in turn over generations, much like genetic fuel. And that means that the end alteration, the antibodies, don't spread indefinitely. But it does mean that we can re release, in principle, a handful of mice and alter the local population. We may even be able to keep it confined within political boundaries of a given town by driving what's known as an underdominant system. So this is a system in which there is selection for whichever allele is in the majority. So the altered engineered allele that is protective against disease would be selected for in towns that wanted it. And so in those towns, we could release these daisy threshold mice that would spread the alteration within the town efficiently. The daisy elements would run out of steam. And there would be selection for the engineered antibodies where they were in the majority in the town. But natural selection would act against them on the outskirts where wild types are in the majority. This is obviously a more than decade long plan, but our eventual goal is to develop the technology in these uninhabited offshore islands, determine if it is effective. If so, introduce it, assuming com the communities continue to support it, onto inhabited islands. And then in the meantime, develop this technology in Paramiscus leucopus for potential use on the mainlands with the goal of allowing every community to decide whether or not they would want to engineer their local population in order to prevent tick-borne disease. And of course, if it does work for tick-borne disease, it could also work for potentially other kinds of diseases that are vector-borne or have any kind of reservoir in a wild species. Do you have any questions? Please feel free to contact me by email. And you can also find more information on mice against ticks specifically on uh, responsivescience.org. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asfeld. Uh, our next speaker uh, and final speaker is Dr. Ben Beard, Deputy Director for the Division of Vector-Borne Disease, who will be uh, reviewing the National Strategy for Vector-Borne Disease Control. Thanks, Paul. And um, let me try to get the correct slides up here. Okay, I'm sorry for the delay here. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do just really quickly here, uh, since we're running out of time, is just tell you a little bit about the national strategy uh, uh, efforts here for vector-borne diseases. And, um, and, and basically, to give sort of a framework for this, as some of you would know, um, vector-borne diseases are very rapidly and hugely increasing in the United States. And so, you know, over the last 15 years or so, at least from 2004 through 2017, 
there were over 700,000 cases of vector-borne diseases that were reported here in the United States. Uh, the, the number of reported cases of diseases, really, these are carried by mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas, and this is more than tripled over this period of time. And that, in fact, 75% of all vector-borne diseases <clears throat> over this period of time uh, are tick-borne diseases, and uh, chiefly among those being Lyme disease. And then another important point to make is that mosquito-borne disease epidemics have happened more frequently. Uh, most recently, we've had Zika. Prior to that, we had um, uh, dengue outbreaks and chikungunya that have occurred. Um, and, and then finally, uh, just the whole idea that reported diseases really only reflect a very small number of the actual numbers of uh, vector-borne diseases because under reporting ranges here in the U.S. anywhere from 8 to 12 per, uh, fold uh, for Lyme disease to close to 70 fold for West Nile virus. Um, We've also seen a number of new disease threats. Uh, I mentioned chikungunya and Zika. We've also seen seven new tick-borne disease agents that have um, uh, been um, identified here in the U.S. over the last, um, you know, since 2004 at least, and we've already heard about H. longicornis. Uh, additionally, more people are at risk because of lo local uh, global commerce, that is, that moves mosquito ticks and fleas around the world. Uh, also, infected travelers uh, go from um, disease endemic areas um, and, and come here into the United States and other parts of the world as well, bringing with them pathogens that they're potentially exposed to. And then, of course, mosquitoes and ticks move these around the U.S., causing local outbreaks. And then we've also had uh, issues like climate, changing climate and land use patterns that have, have an impact. So the backdrop of this really um, was the impetus for a paper that we recently published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Really, it was a call of action, call to action for a national strategy or national action plan. And this paper, um, you know, really uh, calls for a concerted, sustained national effort to address the existing problems and to reverse the upper trend, upward trends in vector-borne diseases. And um, it also mentions that the response will require coordination across a national network of collaborators. So to say a little bit about this plan, uh, this national strategy, um, we at CDC have been leading coordination of this effort, and um, the um, strategic priorities seek to improve the national vector in human case surveillance. Uh, to improve vector-borne disease prevention, diagnosis, and treatment efforts, and then finally, um, to build capacity at state and local levels to implement vector-borne disease prevention and control programs. The, in terms of a national strategy development status, uh, the formal drafting process began um, in uh, December of 2018, and it, it has involved six different federal departments and 12 agencies. You see these in the list below here. So agencies from the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Defense, uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, EPA, Department of Interior, and uh, from FEMA uh, in the Department of Homeland Security. The uh, effort was actually completed in April of 2019 in terms of the first draft of this. And uh, the national strategy uh, document has now been cleared through CDC, and it's um, in clearance in Health and Human Services right now, and HHS will uh, network it with the other federal departments who are, um, um, who are um, involved in the effort. And so um, we anticipate that the release date for this will be sometime around uh, the summer of 2019, hopefully next month in July. And uh, the national strategy will provide a basis for developing action plans for vector-borne disease prevention and control in the United States. And by action plans, what we mean by that are really efforts that um, or aimed at getting more down into the details of exactly what needs to be accomplished, how will we measure success, uh, what are the timelines for implementation, and, and who specifically will have responsibility for this. So um, finally, this is a real busy, busy slide, and I'm not going to go through, through it other than to say this just really shows that from the first meeting that occurred in February, I'm sorry, in December, in December of 2018, 
uh, some of the key activities that were done uh, in that process we, uh, to strategy development, uh, a series of webinars that we ha had um, with these partners where uh, we sorted through all of the um, uh, details, the uh, a vision statement, a mission statement, and some overarching goals, and then uh, some specific sub-strategies. And then uh, to where we are right now, um, as I said, that uh, the document is going through clearance. So I think with that, I will um, stop and turn it back to Dr. Mead. And I think we may have a few minutes for questions and answers. And uh, I think the uh, time for the webinar has been extended a little bit so that there's at least time for more discussion. Thanks. Okay, I believe we're ready um, to take questions at this point. Um, and I don't know if uh, all the presenters can see their questions. Uh, William, are you able to uh, see? There are a number of questions on AlphaGal, one of which was um, I whether don't, or not I don't see them, so. Okay, I'm sorry. Well then, uh, and I don't either now, unfortunately. My apologies to everyone. Um, but the first uh, one of the questions or that seemed to be a theme was whether or not uh, alpha-gal or the syndrome was likely to be traced or reportable like other um, in, uh, tick-borne diseases through surveillance. Yeah, um, it's not really my call on that. Uh, I think we're, we're just trying to get our handle on, on what's really going on at this point. Um, we're hoping that this large case control study will provide some, some evidence of some of the, the risk factors rather than these associations that have been made in these individual case reports. Um, but, you know, that's, that's a, a much bigger question than, than I would answer. Um, I mean, it, it's certainly generating a lot of attention. And, uh, and that's really why our division and branch is, is beginning to look at this. I mean, normally we're not looking at non-infectious uh, conditions, but um, I think, you know, there has, has been enough attention that we, we do need to, to look at it and see, see if we can uh, work with these experts, basically, in the, in the uh, that are actually seeing patients rather than us uh, just enumerating reports. Great, thank you. And another uh, question that has come up is, will there be a copy of the slides or presentations available after the meeting? Um, yes, the, the meeting will is recorded and will be uh, available online, although I can't give you the exact uh, time frame for that, but uh, we will uh, be posting this um, when the transcripts and everything are available. So um, on the issue of reportable diseases, the question has come up again for Dr. Beard about uh, what, what uh, how does CDC determine reportable diseases and how would they consider, would they consider adding ehrlichiosis to that list given its life-threatening nature? And maybe that's also a question for Dr. Nicholson. Oh, yeah, Paul, I can answer that as, as well as yourself. Um, you know, the, the way diseases become uh, reportable in the United States is really by um, an action of the, uh, the Council of uh, State and Territorial Epidemiologists, CSTE. And um, so this is, uh, the, the states actually have to determine whether or not a disease is nationally notifiable. And then along with that uh, comes case definitions and, and um, things, for example, the question about um, red meat aller allergy. It would have to be a, a decision of CSTE that this should be reportable, and then there would have to be case definitions drafted and, and all the ways to make it um, reportable. 
And, um, and then, of course, with ehrlichiosis, the question about that, ehrlichiosis, ehrlichia is actually already uh, reportable. And so if there are any questions about what diseases are reportable, uh, you can find that um, through, um, actually, if you go to, um, to the MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, you know, those diseases are all line, line listed in there, especially if you go to the uh, um, annual summary uh, documents. And Paul, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that more generally, but that would be pretty much what I would say about it. All right, thank you. Uh, William, anything to add about uh, surveillance data on ehrlichiosis and trends that are No, I think over time we're, we're, we're trying to make it better because we do have, you know, a number of things lumped under singular categories when we know that they're actually caused by a variety of, of actual individual pathogens. And so it's always very difficult to do that. Uh, we, um, you know, there's been a recent uh, revision of the uh, CSTE definition uh, going through the last meeting on spotted fever group because we know that that represents a, a, a large number of species um, and you know the name was changed several years back but we we know that that creates a burden and, and as far as adding something as a notifiable disease I, I think most of the state health departments uh, realize that it's, it's, it's a burden on them to to follow up on these cases, so I don't know that they would necessarily be looking to add even more, but I do think getting a little more uh, specificity on our uh, case definitions will help because um, we would like to know, for example, ehrlichiosis, how much is actually due to Uingii versus ehrlichia chaffiensis versus possibly others, and you know, those are somewhat lumped. Got it. On that topic, it has also been been asked whether or not um, would it be worth monitoring ehrlichiosis patients for meat allergy uh, since the infections are a result of exposure to that tick. Is that part of your plan? Uh, not currently. I mean, we will be doing testing on those patients that are enrolled to see if they show any correlation with uh, uh, ehrlichiosis serial conversion, even if there is no uh, illness. Uh, we think that would be important to do. Uh, in, in the Arkansas study that was reported in a poster, they, they did look at just geographic distribution, and the distribution of red meat allergy uh, was similar to within the state and in and, and terms of number of cases as well as geographic distribution as ehrlichiosis. But um, again, it's, it's, it's an association at this point. Um, I think it would be important to, to do that over time. Um, but again, some of those ehrlichiosis cases could also be due to ehrlichia uingii, which again is transmitted by Amblyomma americanum. But we don't, we don't necessarily have those samples in hand. A lot of those are sent through commercial labs and, and we'll never see a sample from that patient. Great, thank you. Well, one, sorry, one final question for you right now. I'm sorry to beat up on you, but it, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> there has been a question about, is there any issue with vaccines? There have been some healthcare pro, um, personnel stating that there are at least 29 vaccines contraindicated, in, uh, presumably in patients with alpha-gal allergy. Is this something um, you're aware of? It's certainly a caution, and we, we've had a conference call with the uh, vaccine safety people at CDC and others to, to at least be aware of that. Um, but how much of a problem that is, we really have no idea. But, uh, you know, most vaccines are going to use uh, some animal products, like gelatin is a, a fairly common one. It's at a very, very low concentration, but it's used as a stabilizer in a lot of these products. Uh, and so, Glycerol is sometimes included, so I mean, the potential is there, but uh, the reality, I don't know that it's really been looked at that closely. Okay, thank you. Uh, a, a couple of questions for Dr. Beard. Um, the first one is, um, regarding the national strategy, will there be a report due out this summer, uh, and will it be posted? 
Yeah, um, thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, yes, what our, what our plans are at a minimum is to post it on our website, and so it will be available publicly there. Uh, I'm sure there will other be other venues in which it, um, you know, it's presented, but at a minimum, we'll have it posted on our website for uh, people for the public to access. Thanks. A question, uh, presumably for Dr. Esfeld, uh, although maybe others have comments. Uh, is there any research to block the microbiome in ticks to make them inhospitable to ha pathogens? So we had originally considered altering the ticks, but the problem with any kind of generational drive-based approach is that it requires many generations to spread. So affecting an entire tick population would either require waiting, waiting many, many decades or releasing, raising and releasing hundreds of millions or billions of ticks into the environment. And our experience in talking with communities is that uh, people are not so keen on the notion of being bitten by engineered ticks, even if it would prevent disease. They would much rather that we alter the reservoirs, if at all possible, which is, and also the mice reproduce much more quickly so it's just a more feasible strategy. That said, we are working on ways of immunizing the mice against the ticks directly, um, using subolysin as a, as a tick protein marker, which causes, in some cases, the ticks to fall off before they get a complete blood meal and die. So if we can turn a, a major reservoir host, such as Paramiscus leucopus, inhospitable to the ticks, then we should be able to substantially reduce the population, at least of Ixodes and possibly of other ticks if we could target them. But that's very much speculative. The rest of it is more engineering. This should be feasible given enough time. Can't say how long it will take. But that one may just not be possible. We're not sure yet. OK, thank you. Uh, another question for Dr. Beard. Uh, can you comment on uh, CDC's position regarding the value of testing human biting ticks? And I believe the question refers to ticks removed from a person as opposed to necessarily um, recovered from the environment. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, yeah, our, our current view is, um, is that we don't see a great value in testing ticks that have been uh, collected off people for pathogens for clinical purposes. And what I mean by that is for the purpose of guiding whether or not a patient should be treated or not treated prophylactically you know, based on whether the tick that they removed was positive or negative. And the reason for that is that if the, te if the tick is negative, then that doesn't mean that the person might not have had another tick that was on them that they didn't see that could have exposed them as well. Uh, typically, especially the nymphal stages of ticks come in, in large numbers, and, um, and so the one that was on you might have been uh, positive, might have been negative, but there might have been another that was on you that was positive. And so if you decided not to treat just simply b because the tick was positive or negative, then it could be misleading. And then and additionally, if the tick was positive, uh, you know, it may or may, may not have transmitted illness. So uh, what we basically say is if a person lives in a disease endemic area, that they had a, a tick that's been on them uh, for, um, you know, th up to 36 hours or more, that, um, that they should be treated prophylactically, um, you know, to prevent uh, pathogens that might have been in that, that uh, tick. And so we don't see a large additional value in testing those ticks, however. So I, I do want to mention, though, that doesn't mean that we're not in favor of testing ticks for pathogens. And in fact, we are, have recently um, been able to provide funding to state health departments uh, to collect ticks to uh, specifically Exodes scapularis and Exodes pacificus. Um, and that we've written guidance for, and we're in the process of writing guidance for the other important tick vectors. And so um, what, what we are working with the states to do is to get better information on the uh, distribution and the um, 
and the density of, of ticks that we collect uh, and what pathogens are in those ticks. And what we're hoping is that this will help us better define areas of, of human risk in, in areas where Lyme disease is not so common. And at least we can know better about the risk that's there based on uh, the ticks that are there and the pathogens that they, they harbor. So the short answer is we, we don't see great value in testing ticks for, for diagnosis and clinical purposes, but we do see a great value in testing ticks uh, for surveillance purposes, and, uh, and we're involved in those activities. Thank you, and, and if I may, I'll just add one other point um, that, uh, that I think is sometimes uh, overlooked, which is that um, typically when testing uh, specimens from a patient, there are fairly rigorous standards of laboratory practice that have to be enforced in order to assure that uh, medical decisions are being made on, on uh, good and solid data. One of the other challenges with uh, tick testing regimens is that uh, because they aren't testing a human specimen, uh, labs do not necessarily have to meet the same standards of, of, uh, of diagnostic care as uh, clinical laboratories, and yet we see that sometimes patients are going to their providers with this information and, and getting, uh, it is influencing medical care. So there is some concern about um, having sort of uh, medical care provided based on laboratory testing, which um, does not really meet, uh, necessarily meet the uh, standards uh, that would be required of any clinical testing laboratory. There is uh, one other question, um, or several other questions, but one is uh, whether or not there are any BSL-4 level tick-borne agents. And I believe um, there are some in the viral area, like uh, uh, CCHF, Congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever, uh, as well as some others. But uh, uh, do one of the other speakers, uh, perhaps Ben or, or William, uh, want to add to that list? This is Ben. I can comment really quickly. The uh, pathogens that are here in the United States, um, we're not aware of any that are BSL-4. I think Powassan is uh, BSL-3, and as far as I know, um, so is heart, Heartland and, um, and uh, Bourbon viruses. Um, in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world, there are the, you know, the Russian spring summer encephalitis, uh, uh, TBE, uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Yeah, I know that uh, Crimean Congo, as, as Paul mentioned, is uh, BSL-4. I'm not so sure about the others, but there's a quick guide to this, the BMBL, the, um, uh, which are the, the um, guidance for work with um, uh, bio, proper biosafety and biocontainment of pathogens in laboratories, and it's got an updated list of all these, these pathogens. Uh, and what the current biosafety level is for, for each of these. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question, which is, can any of the presenters comment on the upward trend of co-infections, as in the case with Ixodi scapularis, Lyme disease, Babesiosis, Ehrlichia, Powassan disease, dependent upon the length of attachment and, it, and inoculant transfers? Also mentions that the Asian longhorn tick has been shown to carry various pathogens in respective regions. And, and uh, maybe Ms. Bonilla, you could comment first on some of the pathogens that have been uh, associated with, with H. longicornis? We may have lost her, or, or maybe it's not a fair question, but um, it, do others want to comment, uh, Dr. Beard, on co-infections and increasing trends? Um, I can comment on that really quickly. I'm sorry, I hope you can't see my screen right now. I was trying to call, um, open up a recent presentation where I had a list of all the pathogens that have been in uh, Asian longhorn ticks. 
So in terms of the pathogens that um, have been found in Asian longhorn ticks, there's been a wide range of uh, anaplasma species that have been found, um, uh, Bartonella species, a number of Borrelia species as well, Coxiella, Ehrlichia, Rickettsial species. Uh, there have been a number of viruses, uh, tick-borne encephalitis, uh, Langat, Togoto virus, um, severe fever with thrombocytopenia virus for sure, which is one of the ones we're particularly concerned about. And then uh, in terms of pro protozoan pathogens, uh, a number of Babesia species and uh, Tylaria species. And um, so that, you know, there's the potential for that because of all the pathogens uh, that, that, that tick is carried in other parts of the world. Here in the United States, uh, in terms of co-infections, you know, the, the one that I'm most familiar with, I think, is, would, would have to be Exodia scapularis. And as um, many will know, uh, this tick feeds in the immature stages, larvae, and in some cases as nymphs, on, um, on wild rodents, chiefly uh, Paramiscus species. And um, which, which are very important reservoirs for a number of important human pathogens. So this includes uh, Borrelia, uh, the Lyme, disease, Lyme uh, Borreliosis, and um, in some cases Borrelia miyamotoi and Borrelia um, maonii as well, and then uh, Anaplasma and uh, Poisson virus and Babesia. So you know ticks that have fed on rodents <coughs> that. Or have co-infections for these pathogens, you know, are likely to be co-infected as well. And uh, there have been a number of publishes, studies that have been published that have looked at co-infection rates in wild-collected ticks. And um, you know, I can't comment off the, on the top of off the top of my head on what the co-infection rates are. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Mead or, or uh, Dr. Nicholson can, but um, it seems to me that it's, it's ranged somewhere around the, you know, between uh, one and five percent in most of the studies that I, I remember seeing. And this is with one or two or possibly three different pathogens. In terms of infections in people, uh, there have been a number of studies that have looked at this. I can't comment on whether these rates uh, are, are going up or now or, or not. I do know that the rates of all the reportable tick-borne diseases have, have in fact been increasing uh, very significantly. So uh, you, would in, you would assume that there might, would be some increase in um, co-infection rates. But I think all of that is probably driven by the fact that these diseases that are carried by um, black-legged ticks are very much emerging. I think the reasons for that is that uh, changing land use patterns, uh, 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 increasing deer populations, and uh, the way that um, uh, the built environment uh, in sub suburban areas have, have expanded into areas that are, where ticks are very common. And uh, all of this has led to increasing exposure of people to potentially infected ticks. And I think the more um, these, uh, more common this is, the more likely you are to have um, co-infections as well. So I'll stop with that, and others might want to comment further. Uh, anything to add, Dr. Nicholson? Often we, we, we only look for what we're looking for. And, and uh, so, you know, if there was a co-infection in those ticks, we may or may not be even, even looking at that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Beard, this is a, a similar question about the national strategy. Is there, um, do you know how that information will be disseminated? Or is there a way that people can sign up to be notified when it is released? Yeah, I, I think what I would suggest if, if you just want to check back at our website, you know, around mid to late July, if you don't want to do that on a regular basis, because we really don't know that what we don't know is how long it's going to take this to come through clearance, and we, it's not in, in our control. So uh, we will post it as soon as it's cleared. But I know that you can go to our website, um, you know, www.cdc.gov slash Lyme disease, which is the Lyme disease website. And, um, and we, you can register for updates so that when there's a change or update in the page, um, 
you'll get a notification and so that you can go and uh, go in and see what was changed and that, that might be a way uh, to, to, uh, to do that. So, and I, I don't know, uh, Dr. Mead, if, you, if you're familiar more with, with that process, but um, that's what I would suggest doing. That, that makes sense, yes. As you point out, um, it's hard to know exactly when things will come out when they're going through a, a chain. Um, I'm looking for uh, additional questions. Um, I think we've covered most of the topics raised. Um, and with that, then I think what I would like to do is um, thank the various presenters for their excellent presentations, for taking time to share them with, uh, with you, and with all of you for tuning in to, um, to hear this. A reminder, uh, you can get more information on tick-borne diseases at, at uh, both uh, the website uh, Dr. Baird mentioned or just www.cdc.gov slash ticks. Um, and with that, I think we will close out this session uh, and remind you all to, uh, to wear repellents and do tick checks and, and bathe after you've been in uh, an exposed area. So um, I will turn it back over to the, uh, the operator for any final comments. Thank you everyone for your participation in today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.